are back. It's been a few weeks, but we are back with our videos. Um, so we're jumping ahead. We're on chapter 17, Nations and Empires between 1850 and 1914. Uh, 1850, this is going to be around Civil War time in America. 1914 is going to be the beginning of World War I. So we are rapidly approaching modern history and things that we know and talk about today um, are really going to get a lot of their links and their beginnings right now in this chapter. So chapter 17, Nations and Empires. All right, so our storyline, nation state building and imperial expansion changed the map of the world. So we'll talk about once again, what is a nation? Or what was the previous definition of what a nation was and what is the new one that's gonna happen during the 19th century or the 1800s? What's gonna happen during that time period? We're gonna see how industrialization, science and technology enabled states in North America and Western Europe and to a lesser extent Japan to overpower other regions politically, militarily, and economically. So we're gonna see the beginning formation of colonization and imperialism that is going to happen on wide scale during the 19th century and the earliest 20th century. We can even say this is continuing to happen in the 21st century today. And finally, we're gonna go over European, American, and Japanese imperialists encounter significant opposition in Africa and Asia. We'll talk about the Berlin Conference. We'll talk about how uh, Britain is treating. Hello, staff. Don't forget to come to room 101 for the Dean and Title I election. Staff, stop by room 101 today after school for the election. Thank you. Yes, and all these King's Room announcements, okay? So we're going to see how we're going to have opposition to the. Jose Torres, report to the attendance office. Jose Torres, report to the attendance office. You know, maybe we can get Attention there. students, the Boys and Girls Club will be open from 3 to 6 p.m. Supper will be served after school. There will be a college workshop and internships available, and everyone is welcome. Whew. Hopefully there will be no other announcements, but no one can do the way that I do. There's going to be at least 10 more. So the things that we're going to focus on, we're going to identify the institutions that enabled elites in Western Europe the Americas and Japan to consolidate uh, nation states and analyze the degree to which they succeeded during this period. Next up, we're gonna explain the roles that industrialization, science, and technology played in the expansion of powerful states in the rest of the world. We're gonna compare the reactions to imperialism in Africa and in Asia and evaluate how effective their responses, these responses were, excuse me. And finally, we're gonna analyze to, to extent that, analyze the extent to which colonies contributed to the wealth and political stability of the nation states that controlled them. All right, so intro, let me just grab my book because I know at some point in time I'm gonna need to reference it. So we have after the 1850s, the building of nation states in Europe, the Americas, and Oceania. Once again, Oceania is going to be those island nations like the Marshall Islands, uh, Palau, Samoa, um, and Australia and New Zealand as well are all included in Oceania. They're gonna, they're, um, we're gonna see how they benefited from Europeans and those of European descent most. Okay, so we'll see how uh, the formation of these nations are going to benefit Europeans who come to these nations even though all of these nations are populated by indigenous people. So we'll see how the Europeans overtook those native populations, disregard of the native populations, and establish their own European colonies outside of Europe and in other places. Um, we're going to see the rivalry among European states intensifies as new states of Italy and Germany emerge. And we'll see the trickery that led to Italy and Germany being emerging. We're going to see the U.S. expansion is going to be met with resistance. Number one, we have Native American resistance. Number two, we have other colonies in, or other countries in North America, other nations, excuse me, um, that are going to put up a little bit of a fight so that America, North, the United States of America, does not end up controlling the whole entire continent. So Canada and Mexico are going to put up a little fight, okay? All right, we're going to see how Asia and Africa struggle to repel invaders. It's very hard to do that when you have spears and they have guns. Um, or when you know you're bringing them in for trade, and then they start to do corrupt things in your in your areas. Okay. Next up, we're going to see advances of nationalism. 
So making your country number one, that patriotic spirit and imperialism in the second half of the 19th century, as well as expansion of industrialization. So we'll see how it starts in Great Britain, and then eventually it's going to trickle its way on down to a lot of other smaller countries. And some of those countries are going to benefit greatly from industrialization and have the ability to actually rise up in the, the nation ranks. So we're going to see Japan, the United States, all of those uh, countries that were kind of behind in industrialization start to rise up. Attention all students, if you're a woman state facilitator or logistics, please note that you'll be receiving your package tomorrow. If for some reason you receive the school-wide package, please come to the leadership room to exchange it. Thank you. And another announcement. Delightful. All right, so we're into the, uh, the development in this century allowed Western Europe and the US to attain primacy. So prime, all right, primacy in the world. Be number one or be up at the top in the world. And we'll see how even today, Europe and the US are still at the top today. And we can, we can guarantee that it is based on the mistreatment of other nations of subject, subjugated people, of indigenous people, of African people, uh, so on and so forth. So their wealth today in 2019 is directly related to what they did back in the 17, 18, and 1900s. All right, consolidating nations and constructing empires. So previously, well actually throughout this whole entire chapter, we're going to have to figure out, or we're gonna have to decide what makes a nation? Is it having a shared language? Is it having a shared religion? Is it having a shared territory? Is it having a shared ruler? What is a nation? And that's going to change, and the definition of that and what people think a nation should be also shifts during this time period. Um, Enlightenment philosopher, uh, nationalism became closely linked to imperialism in the second half of the century. It's very interesting. So when people are really happy about their countries, it's usually because their countries are expanding or taking over other places. So that's why nationalism and imperialism, once again, imperialism is taking over another, a host, a mother country or a, a, a big country, like a, like a Britain or a US, taking over a smaller nation and controlling their political, social, economic, um, political, social, economic, and cultural systems as well. Like usually completely wiping out the culture of the previous, of the, of the I don't, don't wanna say lesser, but of the, the minority population and bringing in uh, the European way of life. <clears throat> okay, so we'll see how that's going to happen um, and how when people are happy about their countries, it's usually because their country is taking over somebody else's nation. So there is a direct correlation to uh, nationalism being patriotic and happy with your country and how much land or how many places or how many battles your country is engaging in and actually winning um, and coming out on top. Okay, so Enlightenment philosophers had emphasized nations people who share common past, territory, cultures, and traditions. So this is gonna be the Enlightenment, Enlightenment philosopher's idea of what a nation is. But a lot of these people who are gonna get caught up in nations or gonna get caught up in unification uh, processes may not necessarily agree with it. Because if you have a, they're gonna, they're gonna believe that if you have a common language, maybe that's more important than having a common religion. Or if you do have a common religion, or excuse me, a common uh, religion, then maybe your language might be different or maybe your traditions might be different. There's so many different things that we're gonna talk about in this chapter as it relates to nation building. So building a nation, we're gonna see local elites create nations compelling diverse groups of people and regions to accept unified laws, network of laws, central administration, time zones, national markings, and single regional dialect as national languages. All right, so basically the big push happens so if I'm giving you, well, I'm, I'm going to give you an example that we're going to talk about a little bit later. So Germany and Italy, for example, are going to be two great, great examples of places that ended up being unified during this time period that were previously kind of their own separate fragmented states, and we're going to see them all coming together. Um, one way that, we, that, that, that they are convinced to come together, liberal thinkers who are usually going to be nationalistic type people um, usually have a little bit more money in their pocket as well, so they're going to be the ones to support um, the formation of nations because people with money in their pocket realize that in order to really thrive and to make more money, we have to have a they have to have a unified system of currency. They have to have unified measures. Ms. Garcia, if you're still on campus, please come back turn two oh seven. Again, Ms. Garcia, please come back turn two oh seven. My goodness! Any more announcements? Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, so. 
we're going to see that the people who are the, the very rich or wealthy liberals who are nationalists are going to support having that unified or that, that's having a standardized, excuse me, weight system so that if so one pound over here is the same as one pound over here. If I'm in Compton, one pound is the same as if I'm in Garvina or if I'm in Beverly Hills, it's all should be the same. That's what they were hoping for in some of these uh, fragmented areas. Um, and so we'll see all that happening. So usually the push to, to unify or the push for nations is gonna come from wealthy liberals who are nationalist. Okay, so please remember that. All right, um, and so we're going to see education and military service were used to overcome regional identities. Um, so no longer is it, okay, I grew up on 120th and Compton, and you grew up on 120th and Vermont, so we're not the same people. Now it's, okay, well, if we both fought in the military for this country, then we are the same person. Um, if we have an education from this region, then we are unified the same person, okay? It's kind of like HBCUs, historically, historically black colleges that I went to. Um, there's a unification in all HBCUs. There's over 100 of them. And so when I see somebody else who went to an HBCU, it's like, oh, it's family, because we went through the same things. We have a shared identity, um, and we understand what's going on uh, in our culture and things like that, okay? So giving you guys a, a modern day example of how um, sometimes your education or service can overcome regional identities. So even when I was at HBCU, I'm from Los Angeles, but where I was from did not matter as much because I had the HBCU identity and we were there as a family, regardless of whether I was from Los Angeles and my best friend was from Atlanta, another one was from New York or wherever else they may have come from. All right, so as we expand our empires, we're gonna see nation state buildings and imperialism or the conquest for new territories went hand in hand. So once again, the way you keep your citizens happy is by taking other people's land. You can't keep them happy if you don't take anyone else's land. I don't know why that's the correlation, but I promise you any book you look into is going to say uh, there is a connection between nation building and imperialism, okay? So we always want to, to move on and to grow and to flourish. Um, because more land means more prosperity for a country. Less land, less prosperity, so your people are not as happy. When the country is prosperous, people are nicer, and they're nice to the government, and they don't overthrow the government. When they're not happy, when we're not expanding, we have more revolts, more tension, more issues. All right, so Germany, France, US, Russia, and Japan caught up to Britain by industrializing and seizing new territories. Um, so. We know that Great Britain is first in industrialization just because of their location, number one, and their access to resources, number two, and their established government, number three. Those three things are what's gonna allow Great Britain to rise up in the industrialization market. They're gonna have a large share of the world before the rest of the world even catches up. But as they catch up, Germany, France, US, Russia, and Japan all want their fair share of the world. They're like, hey, hey, Britain, you're not the only one who's important. We also are important. We also want our voices heard. So they're going to make sure that they are equipped with the proper weapons, techniques, uh, technology, and things like that to battle with Britain and get out there and also get their own colony the same way that Great Britain has gone out in the world and had their own colonies. Um, we're going to see imperial rule facilitate widespread movement of labor, capital, um, commodities and information. So as slavery starts to fall away as an institution, there are lots of things that need to be produced, but we need people to actually be able to produce them. So we're going to see a lot of minority populations, people that we call minorities today, even though they're probably the majority of the world. Those minority populations from, uh, from smaller places in Europe, from Asia, uh, and smaller populations. That's fine, you guys. Sorry, give me like two seconds. Austro-Hungarian labor movement. All right, so we're gonna see a lot of people like Chinese workers. Uh, we're gonna see Indians from the country of India, not Native Americans. Um, we're gonna see Irish people, Polish people, Jews, Italians, and Greeks. Um, all moving around um, to basically fulfill the labor requirements that are left by slavery ending, okay? Um, and also, not only slavery ending, but also new territories being seized. So we're gonna talk about Brazil and what happens in Brazil with the, with the Amazon and rubber trees and things like that. Um, 
We're going to see colonial subjects who are not considered members of the nation and were given little or no representation in home governments creating tension between nations and empires. So just because I control you does not mean that you are part of my country. So we can see that in Puerto Rico. That's a modern day example that we see today. Puerto Ricans are technically citizens of the US, but they have no voting power. Okay, they have absolutely no voting power. So in actuality, when it comes to power in the country, they have none of it, but we, we use their resources. We use their labor. We use the people for the mil for our military, for other things like that, um, but we don't consider them, uh, we don't give them representation in our government. Even though they can vote, their vote just kind of means nothing. It's like, oh, here's a vote. What's it going to? I don't know, but here's a vote, okay? So we're gonna see how a lot of these colonial subjects are not gonna be happy with someone coming into their country, taking all their supplies, and then telling them that they have no rights. And we'll see how that is gonna to lead to more revolts, more rebellions, more revolutions, and more independence movements along the way. Honestly, going all the way into World War I. World War I, the end of that, 1918, 1919. All right, new nation, expansion of nation building in the Americas. So, Got to start at home, and then from home we can go to the other countries or other places around the world. So new nations in the new world wish to create widespread loyalty to their political institutions and expand territorial domains. So we're going to see how this expansion happens. Um, oh, it's already there. I have to say it. But Americans, Americans saw most complete saw most complete assimilation of new possessions with nation building nation state builders turning outlying areas into provinces. So instead of just claiming an area, the U.S., when they started to go west, so we know the Manifest Destiny is that westward expansion going and heading towards California and eventually heading towards Hawaii and Alaska. But as they're making that, 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 that Manifest Destiny, that moving outward, instead of just saying, this is my land, I like it, the U.S. is like, it's not just my land, I'm going to make it a state. By making it a state, I'm bringing that into the United States I'm bringing it into the fold. It can never be taken away from us. And we have the, the ability to do a lot more with it than if we just say, oh, this is my land, so-and-so's land. No, this is the, the country's land, and the country has different rights. But we're going to see how creating states and manifest destiny is going to lead us directly into the Civil War because we have people on both sides who say, hey, this area right here should be only for free states. Well, no, 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 this area only should be for, for slave states. And we're going to see how that's going to lead to conflict between free, free states and slave states, which eventually is going to lead us into the Civil War between 1860 and 1865 with uh, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, So the U.S., we have military might, diplomacy, and power of numbers enabled the U.S. to claim territory spanning the North American continent. Okay. So we know one thing for sure is that they're gonna buy land. They're gonna buy land from France. So France is suffering because we read previously about Napoleon um, and trying to just pay for the revolution, the different wars that he's fighting out throughout the world, including the one where he went to Russia and lost. So as a result of that, in 1803, France is going to sell the Louisiana Territory, which is going to basically increase the size of the US by over 50%. So they're gonna grow they're gonna double their size in no time, okay? So we become a country in 1787 officially. By 1803, we are already doubled in size because we purchased land from Louisiana um, at a mere $5 million. I mean, that's probably a lot of money back then, but when you think about it, $5 million, uh, it, 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 there's, I mean, that was, that was cheap. We, we kinda got away on that one, okay? All right, um, we're also gonna see um, then we have the Mexican-American War that happens um, between 18, I don't want to give you guys the wrong answers, but I believe it's between 1840. No, no, that's too late. Uh, I'd rather just look it up. Oh, was, yeah. Doubt yourself. Never a good thing. All right, so the Mexican American Wars from 1846 through 1848. And in 1848, that's when Mexico gives up a large portion of territory that connects the Louisiana Purchase uh, to the rest of, uh, to the western part of 
North America, excuse me. And so we'll see that the U.S. is going to grow again substantially all within. So 1803, 1804 is when the Louisiana Purchase happens. 1848 is when Mexico loses California, Colorado, Oregon, uh, Washington, uh, I said Arizona, Texas, uh, Utah, parts of Utah, and I'm drawing some blanks with some other places, okay? But uh, Nevada, and I think that's it, okay? So that's when they're gonna lose all that. So we have between 1789 and 1848 is when the majority of the land in the U.S., the continental U.S., is procured or is uh, taken, okay? And we'll see how, if you guys know your history about, the, about California at least, 1848 should let you guys know when California becomes a state. We have a football team called the San Francisco 49ers because they found gold in 1849 which means that we became a state in 1850. So 48, they took, or 48, Mexico lost California. 49, gold is found in California. And 50, California becomes a state. So it's like boom, boom, boom. Year after year after year after year. All right, so manifest destiny. Americans believed it was God's will to expand westward and obtain new territories via purchase, treaty, and military warfare. So once again, even though we are a secular nation that separates church and state, even though we're secular, we separate those two things, we still have this belief that God wants us to have the land from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Pacific Ocean, and everything in between should be ours. That might be, but we'll see what our we'll see what our neighboring countries in Canada and Mexico are going to think about that a little bit later. Um, but you guys can see manifest destiny. Very, very important to know manifest destiny is that God told Americans that they were supposed to have the land from sea to shining sea, okay? From ocean to ocean, that's supposed to be American land. All right, civil rights and state rights. Um, the United States territorial and economic growth, okay? So territorial expansion and the question of free or slave labor in the new territories eventually caused the Civil War. So previously they had a Mason-Dixon line. So that Mason-Dixon line is right around kind of where Kansas is and just kind of in that area or, you know, that same kind of horizontal line. And so basically if you were above the Mason-Dixon line, that meant that you got to be a, that you were a free state where no slavery was allowed. If you were below the Mason-Dixon line, that means that you were a slave state and you were able to have slavery. And we're going to see how as new states continue to be uh, uh, procured or established, west of these areas, how it's going to be a fight between, do I want it to be stay, slave, do I want it to be free? And certain areas don't even want slavery to be there, but it's going to be there anyway, okay? Um, and so we'll see the Civil War, let's the abolish, ab abolition of slavery and granting of citizens to free, granting of citizenship to free male slaves, okay? So it says in the Amendment of the Constitution, 13, 14, and 15, that all men are going to have voting rights. That is a, yeah, that's not really gonna happen like the way it says it's gonna happen, um, but at least for a seven year time period. So a whole seven years, a whole seven years right after slavery ends, um, you have African Americans who actually are able to be actively involved in the government. That's only happening though because the US government has sent National Guard troops to the South to make sure that Southern leaders allow African Americans to flourish and to thrive and to be their best selves. But as we have a presidential change, that president is going to come in and say, hey, we don't need these National Guards in the South anymore. As those troops are pulled out of the South, e almost immediately we have Jim Crow laws popping up, which are those separate but equal laws that will take uh, America into the 1960s, 1970s, um, and so forth. Okay. All right, Reconstruction, let's go back to Reconstruction. That seven year period, it's gonna be, uh, oh no, I didn't even talk about it. All right, anyway, Reconstruction, though, we have our first African-American senators being uh, elected. One of them's name is Hiram Rebels. Um, pretty famous guy, if you go to page 641, it is talking about uh, Reconstruction. And so African-Americans were actually involved in, uh, in the society. They had a chance to be educated, Part of the reason why HBCUs, the school that I went to, the schools that I went to, the school that I went to, the type of school that I went to, were developed was because of Reconstruction. They realized, the U.S. today, that, that there was a large group of the population who did not have education because it was literally illegal for slaves to learn how to read or write or do math, things like that. So because of that, the U.S. was like, well, it's our duty to educate these people, give them their own schools, hence why we have historically black colleges popping up after slavery time so that these uh, formerly 
formerly, uh, former slaves are able to be educated and live their best lives, okay? All right, um, what else in Reconstruction? I think that's pretty much it, but as I said previously, Reconstruction ends swiftly seven years after the Civil War when we have a new president coming in who basically says, the South is fine, they're not gonna do anything illegal or anything crooked, let them uh, patrol themselves and let's remove those troops, which is gonna have an immediate negative impact on African Americans in that area, all right? So it says right here, Reconstruction was not successful. Couldn't have been, because we know it took over 100 more years for African Americans to finally get the right to vote. All right, um, or about 100 more years for them to get the right to vote, from 1865 to about 1964 with the Civil Rights Voting Act of 1964, okay? So we're gonna see that uh, as, as re Reconstruction is not successful, we have a counter-revolutionary pressure, we have counter-revolutionary pressure that leads to the denial of voting rights for African Americans, with restoration of planner rule in Southern states, Terrorism from former Confederates who sought to reverse African Americans' gains and restore white planters to power. Um, and so we'll see a lot of negative Jim Crow era laws popping up during this time period. Once again, Jim Crow is that separate but equal, keeping the African Americans away from European Americans, um, making sure that they have separate but supposedly equal facilities, even though they're not going to be equal, not even close to being equal. Okay? All right. Um, along with the rise of the KKK, the Ku Klux. Ku Klux Klan, okay? They're gonna come around right around the time of slavery, or the end of slavery, and then we're gonna see another rising of them happen after World War I, and then we'll see another one happening after, like, around World War II, civil rights, somewhere in that time period, okay? All right, so the defeat of the South led to a stronger national government, though. So what's gonna happen, instead of the South and the, the, South and the North functioning as two separate countries, they're gonna function as one country, and when they do that, they're going to be able to combine their powers, combine their industrialization powers, which is going to lead to a stronger economy, more money for the whole entire country, and it's going to raise the ranking and the status of the United States during this time period, actually kind of elevating it to where it is currently. So had there been no civil war, there would be no America as number one because we would not have had a chance to unify. We would still be two separate countries, one with slave labor, one with free labor. All right, so we've made it all the way to slide number 10. We are doing something, just 30 more to go, okay? All right, so you guys can see, we went over this uh, with Dr. Graver. Oh, if you're in my fifth period, but if you're in my fourth period, you did not. Um, it's very, very important to check out this map, and it's a very, very detailed map. I actually want you guys to write the details and give me my railroad tracks and give me my different colors and different things, okay? And what you guys will see in this time period, so the beginning part of uh, Canada, for instance, Canada is only gonna be in the lower portion of Canada. And you might ask, why is Canada focused only to this lower part by the US? If you think about Canada's geography, or if you think about Canada's weather, it is absolutely frigid the closer you get to Russia, okay? So the closer you are to Russia, the colder it is, which means that people back in these time periods have to stay lower so they can stay warmer and also use the land for agriculture and be able to grow on it. But if they go up higher, it's usually colder uh, for a longer period of time, the soil is colder, and they're not able to do what they need to do. And so we're gonna see the expansion heading westward in Canada that really does not happen until after the US starts to go westward. Because Canada is like, ah, 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 you guys will not be taking our land because I know that you guys wanna expand all the way over here, okay? All right, economic. The United States territorial and economic growth continued. Economic and industrial development. The U.S. joins Britain and Germany as an economic giant. So the Civil War caused the U.S. to rise exponentially in the rankings and be up there with Great Britain and Germany. We'll talk about Germany in a second and how they were able to rise as well. All right, limited liability. Joint stock companies became a powerful source of mobilizing capital from shareholders and banks and brokerage firms as intermediaries made fortune. Fortune, excuse me. So this is gonna be our introduction into the stock market. So the way this works, basically a shareholder is a partial or a small owner of a company who has decided that it's better to invest their money in the company and let someone else run the business for them. As that business makes more profits, the shareholder is then going to get residuals or a portion of that profit every time 
uh, there's a release of there's a release of extra money essentially. So basically, I invest in your country in your company. Your company makes money; they pay me back, or they just continue to pay me out after I've been paid back because I've invested in their growth and their long term future. So banks are going to have to thrive and develop during this time period as well because we need large amounts of money that are backed up and insured. We need, we need large amounts of money, not backed up and insured, but large amounts of money. Um, and the way that we can do that is if we have unified banking systems versus just going to one wealthy person. So we're going to see the rise of banks during the late 19th century. Um, we're going to see the rise of brokerage firms, those who connect people to other people. If you're a broker, you're somebody who puts as a connector. So I, if I have money and this company needs money, I'm gonna go to a brokerage firm, get that money, blah, 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 blah. okay? All right, um, so we're gonna see how, how this is gonna change fortunes. And I don't think things have really changed very much in America, but it says by 1890, 1% of all Americans controlled 90% of its wealth. So the top 1% of the population is going to be the one that controls 90% of the wealth. All right, expansions of railroads, lines, symbolize American economic and territorial growth. So we'll see that in 1865, the U.S. only has 35,000 miles of track, a mere 35, 35 miles, 35 miles, 35 years later, we have 200,000 miles of track connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific. And if we go back to our map that we have right here, you guys can see the amount of railroads. So we can say probably originally, the original railroads are gonna be in this area only because this is the only one that's populated. But as we continue to grow and expand and get more land, we have to be able to connect, uh, I can't tell what state that is, I'm not gonna lie to you. Let's see, we have to be able to connect Maryland, okay? We have to be able to connect Maryland all the way to California if we so chose, or all the way up into Oregon and Washington. All right, um, so U.S. is then gonna become a major power because we're you know, investing in our country, we're growing, we're thriving, all these wonderful things. We're coming to an end very, very soon. And we're gonna see a disagreement over what equality should, be, should involve. So once again, as we build nations, there's lots of disagreements on what equality is, what a nation is, who should be involved in our nation, and so on and so forth. Let's see if that's the last one. Uh, yeah, we'll stop there, anyway. Hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you guys tomorrow.